Hey, this is Matt McCall. Welcome to Making Money with Matt McCall. We got a big show coming up today. It's Tuesday, January 11th. The market's been a bit crazy. Well, let's call it spade a spade. It's been pretty damn ugly so far in 2022. But we have some optimistic news coming forward. Today, we're going to talk about what's going on in this market and why we've seen so much volatility and some pullback in the growth stocks. We're also going to talk about a few stocks that look like they have some pricing power, which could do really well in this type of environment. And then finally, we wrap it up with some genetic testing companies. We continue to see more people be tested and tested with COVID as, as Omicron spreads. These companies have been beaten up. Maybe it's now the time to buy. All this and more coming up right now on Making Money. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is January 11th, 2022. It is a Tuesday. And we have the markets right now not looking the greatest so far in 2022, to be honest with you. We have had some selling, especially uh, in growth stocks, which began about mid last year. And we've had some spurts of rallies along the way. But for the most part, they've been really taken down. And we've seen really uh, from top to bottom, whether it be some of the big large cap, mega cap growth names to some of the smaller caps. And the mega caps held up very well uh, heading into 2022. Uh, but recently, they've been getting hit pretty hard as well as we see some money coming out. And we're going to talk about that today. Uh, we're going to talk about three trends that Goldman Sachs says is going to continue to be really big trends uh, in 2022. My thoughts on them, I don't agree with everything they say. And then a couple stocks that they put forward as having uh, pricing power. Very important, I believe, in 2022, especially when we see inflation hanging around interest rates going up. So we're going to talk about a couple companies in there. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with a few, I don't know, let's call it a basket, let's say, of genetic testing companies. Some of them have some exposure to COVID testing as well. And in the middle, we're going to talk about Bitcoin, which had a really, really weird move on Monday. We'll talk about that and so much more. But let's jump into it here right away. And let's talk about this market sell-off. And I'm going to pull up right now the S&P 500. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is as of Monday, this uh, this latest chart, and pulling back and then rallying back towards the end of the day. That's actually a really good sign. Uh, the other thing that I really like to see in this chart here is this white line was resistance, then support. We held it on a pullback in early December. We held it again in a pullback in mid-December, and it was a little bit of a higher low, as you can see that, making its way up. And now, again, another higher low. If this ends up being the short-term pullback, we rally to a new all-time high in the S&P. That is extremely, extremely bullish, folks, uh, from a technical basis. And keep in mind, today, near the low, we were down about 5% from the all-time high. You know, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is because a lot of stocks have been getting hit really hard. The other thing to remember is this happened in a matter of one week. One week ago, we were at an all-time high in the S&P 500. What I've noticed over the last several years, almost the last decade, is when we have pullbacks of 5 to 10% or even corrections between 10 and 20%, they happen so quickly. Because of the uh, connectivity that we have these days, the computing power, the algorithms that are running the major money out there, uh, individual investors having access to trade on their phones and get out of stocks and into stocks as quickly as possible, uh, news flow coming out that everybody has access to what's going on real time through social media. This leads to very quick pullbacks. On the flip side, this leads to very quick rebounds. And that's why we've seen over the last decade or so, most bear markets, most corrections have been much shorter because they snap back much faster, much shorter than we have seen uh, in prior years. And my prior years, see, look, look back on 70, 80 years, typically they're a lot longer, the pullbacks. They're not because we live in a day and age where things aren't the same. You're not calling your broker on the phone to put in a trade. You're not going to the local Charles Schwab and knocking on a door to put in a trade. You're doing yourself within, multi, within, within you know, nanoseconds. So we live in a different world. So when I say the numbers are a bit different and, you know, psychology is still the same. You know, the reasons for selling, the panic, that hasn't changed. But the speed at which that happens has changed dramatically. So when we see these sell-offs, they happen so fast, it's very tough to kind of get ready for it. And then what happens is a week into it, people are panic selling this morning, or sorry, panic selling Monday morning. And that's what happens. You get swung out near the short-term low. Next thing you know, you're chasing your tail at a high. You would have held on to be much better. Because again, as quickly as they come down, they go up just as fast. 
All right, so that's the S&P 500. I also want to pull up here and, and to give you a look at the um, Qs, the QQQ, which tracks the NASDAQ 100. Again, bounced off the lows on Monday, but you can see it hit a new multi-month low, uh, but we did hold above this blue line here, which is a 200-day moving average, and that's important. I want to flip over right now to the NASDAQ composite. You know, there is a difference, folks, between the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100. NASDAQ 100 is the 100 largest uh, stocks in the NASDAQ index, non-financials. The NASDAQ composite is made up of thousands of stocks. So it's, it's, it's much broader, if you will. So you can see here in the chart that it did break this blue line, which is the 200 day moving average. And again, uh, if, we, if I were to go back and I could zoom out here a bit for you, uh, we have not broken, a, oops, sorry, a little too far. We have not broken a 200 day moving average since really, uh, or we haven't been below it since the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, we broke it and we rallied right back quickly above it. What I do like about the action here this week so far is again, we traded below that level and then rallied back. In the Japanese candlestick charts, that is called a tail. And that tail typically, if it's on support, and this part's called the head, it looks almost like a, some type of little animal, right? If it goes and breaks support, but doesn't close below there, it leaves that tail, that is typically extremely bullish if there's follow through for a couple of days. So the rest of the week's gonna be pretty important as we start having uh, earnings come out too uh, later this week. Uh, some of the big financials will start reporting earnings. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So there's gonna be a lot of volatility in the next couple of days, and then we have earnings season for the next couple of weeks. But again, we, we will keep an eye on these charts for you because I feel it's extremely important that we watch this because when it comes down to it, I, I kind of cut my teeth in this, in this industry reading charts over 20 years ago. I wrote a book about uh, how to use charts uh, to swing trade called the Swing Trader's Bible, which I wrote back in, I co-authored it in 08, I think it was. So uh, it's 12 years ago now, 14 years ago, I should say. But there's two other charts I want to show you before we move on to some exciting stuff. And I think this is really important. The first one here is the IWM. This is the iShares Russell 2000 index. It's a small mid cap index of 2000 stocks. And as you can see here, I'll zoom out a little bit for you, but the, the, I drew these lines. I drew these a while ago. I used it in the show the past couple of times. And you can see here, it's been in this range, a very narrow range. It tried to break out in early November and it failed. It then pulled back, but our support line is this white line here. Again, the tail came very close to that uh, just uh, uh, this week, but we held it. And again, we're, we're right on support. So that's typically a very good sign as well uh, when it comes to uh, charts and that we have several indexes that are all sitting on the support level and holding it and even more importantly. The last one, unfortunately, is not holding its support. And this is ARKK. This is the ARK Innovation ETF. I've talked about this a lot. This kind of tracks a lot of what we invest. And you can see here, this is volume. Look at a huge volume coming out of this. And again, leaving a bit of a tail on Monday. And I look at this a few different ways. Um, one, I don't catch a falling knife. We have uh, we were down five days heading into Tuesday, five straight days. And I, I always have to be very careful not to try and pick a bottom, right? So I don't, I'd rather bounce a little bit and play off that. That being said, these four down days here hitting 52 week lows combined with this big volume feels like what is referred to in the market as capitulation, meaning people are saying, I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. And when that happens, typically it's either at or near a short term or a long term bottom. And I've got to tell you, People have been in this ETF, you know, this now at the low on Monday it was down about 49%, almost lost half its value. All six of Kathy Wood's ARC uh, actively traded ETFs on Monday hit 52 week lows. So when we get to those levels, there's a point where people just can't stomach anymore. They're literally stick, sick to the stomach and they throw in the towel, it's capitulation. I feel like we are in the midst of that right now. I can't confirm that until later in the week. And again, that's okay, I'll, I'll pay up a little for it. It's at, $83, give or change, if I pay 90 and I think it's going to 125, it's okay. Because I'd rather not buy the 83 on its way down to 60. So again, I, I will keep you guys up to date on Thursday, show how things have been moving along uh, with the ARK innovation and of course the market in, in general, but uh, it's something I will uh, keep you up to date on. Now I want to switch over to Goldman Sachs, who eh, I don't want to say a love hate, but you know, nothing against them, but sometimes they put out some garbage. Uh, but they have a uh, put out a report uh, Monday. It was um, three investing trends that they believed would continue in 2022. So I took a look at these three and I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about them. And you can kind of get my view on, on how I feel about that. The first one was that uh, growth is still threatened by COVID. Obviously, Omicron is still spreading. 
Uh, I'm down here in Florida right now. I feel like you wouldn't even know there was a pandemic going on down here. I mean, you don't have to wear a mask anywhere. It's it's, it's very unique. <laughs> Coming from the Northeast, it, it's, it seems kind of weird. I almost feel like I'm in Nicaragua where they you don't have to wear a mask either. Uh, very, very interesting down here. But Goldman believes that the GDP in 2022 will be hit because of Omicron, still some slowdowns, some shutdowns. Uh, their initial forecast was for GDP growth, and that's a gross domestic product. That's the growth of the country from 4.2% this year in 2022. They downgraded to 3.5%. Um, do I think COVID's a true threat of growth going forward? I don't. Uh, I, I think it's I, I almost everybody I know has had it. I know I had actually had dinner with somebody the other night, um, a couple, and the, the, the wife's pregnant, and she just got it. I just had dinner with her, but I tested. I feel fine. Um so I, I think it, if you haven't had it, you're probably going to get it. It seems like, and she was boosted uh, and, you know, three shots and it didn't matter. She's had it now twice and she had it before. So it tells me that it, we're all going to get it. And, and, you know, hopefully you stay safe. Hopefully take care of yourself and you're healthy. You know, it doesn't mean much to you or mean much to your health. You get through over it quickly. But I don't see, I, th I think we're at the point now where I'm really seeing the economy open back up. And I think we're going to start seeing uh, more travel, uh, more people going uh, on vacation coming up this summer. So I don't see it as a threat, so I'm, I'm not going to agree with that one. Goldman's second trend, they believe, for 2022 that would continue uh, is uh, margin pressures. And they talked about labor market tightness um, will make it difficult for the margin expansion. And what that means is because the labor market is tight, meaning that it's tough to find workers right now. And we all know that's a story that's been out there for a while. So they have to pay more for workers, which means their overhead, uh, their costs increase. As the costs increase, your profit margin will decrease. So I, I, I do agree with that. It is a tough labor market right now, so I do see that being an issue. Um, they also talked about firms that have high um, you know, other costs out there, fixed or uh, variable costs as well, as well as labor costs, as I just mentioned, uh, will be hurt. And again, that goes with inflation as well. So it's basically an inflation and a job story that can lead to some margin pressures. And I do think you will see that in certain companies, uh, not all, but in certain companies, especially it's called retail service facing, um, you know, restaurants around here, you talk to everybody and, and it's tough to get uh, servers, tough to get bartenders, tough to get people working in the kitchen. And what I find fascinating is that your server down here at some of the restaurants in Florida, especially with the high season now, you're making several hundred bucks a day. That's not a bad gig. I was a server for many years. I was a bartender all through college. It paid for a lot of my college. Uh, you know, there's nothing against being that. I think I think all kids should be a server or bartender at some point because you need to deal with so many different personalities. You're always going to have food coming out wrong, the wrong food, um, bad food. I mean, it's just, it's a hustle. It is truly a hustle. You learn how to really work. And I think it's a great job. And it's amazing more kids and, and more young adults that are, that even older adults that don't have jobs wouldn't turn to that because you could probably make really decent money doing it. Anyway, so I do agree with this, that number two, that there will be margin pressures. Number three is tax reform. And they refer to here that about one trillion of the 1.75 trillion of uh, the social and climate bill that Biden put forward um, will be uh, financed by uh, taxing uh, wealthy Americans. Um, it's, and that's going to include um, IRS enforcement, um, some business owners. When I say wealthy Americans, it's people who make over 10 million. So it's extremely wealthy folks. Um, and if it gets passed this year, uh, we'll see if Manchin comes in to, and, and, and agrees to pass it that it could lower the earnings per share of the S&P 500 by two to 3% is what they're talking about. So the risk that actually is passed because it's gonna to lead to some uh, um, uh, some more taxes because one trillion or 1.75 trillion will be paid through taxes. I thought the one part in here was kind of, uh, it irritated me, uh, that part of that money would go to IRS enforcement. Here's a wake up call to, to both sides of the aisle, to all politicians. It's not about IRS enforcement, it's about the damn tax laws. When the tax law book is this big, people are gonna find loopholes. And you're gonna have some pay somebody to and try to enforce this when you have people on the other side that are much smarter. And they're not breaking the law, they're just outsmarting the government because the government doesn't know how to put together a tax program. Get down to Estonia, where I could do my taxes on a blockchain, be done in, in I think in what takes 30 minutes to do your taxes. It doesn't need to be this hard. If you got rid of the, the loopholes and took it from however big it is, several hundred pages to several pages, you won't need more enforcement because there's no loopholes left. It's very simple, folks. All this does is create more uh, government jobs where in reality, if we just had the right tax codes, the right tax laws, 
You can get all the people that you're mad at that are, that are going through the loopholes. And I'm not mad at anybody. It is what it is. I, you, do, you do what you do. My point is, though, like th this is not the way to fix it. It's just not. Because no matter what you do, whatever you pay that IRS enforcer, some very wealthy person is paying their accountant 50 times more and they're 50 times smarter and they're going to get around it. So you're going to lose. All right, so that was my little rant for the day. It just irritates me when we see our, our taxpayer money being wasted uh, when we could just fix our tax code. All right, so Goldman also came out, and again, I'm just doing this as fun, and I thought it was pretty interesting. They look through the Russell 1000. They look for companies that have uh, high pricing power. And this is good when it comes to margins, because you can keep your margins up if you're able to raise prices with inflation and with, with higher labor costs. So the first one uh, that they took a look at, and I'll pull it up here in a chart for you as well, is Aspen, symbol A-Z-P-N, Aspen Technology. You see these charts all over the place. It, it went up, came down. You know, Aspen Technology is a pretty is interesting company. Uh, it is a $9.7 billion company. It believes its pricing power that it causes about 90%. Um, software is used in plants and industrial sector. So that's pretty fascinating because the industrial sector is being more... Um, uh, digitized and, and technology is coming into it, which means they'd be using more software. So that's really a trend that I believe in. Uh, fiscal 2021, which uh, ended recently at 709 million in revenue. Uh, and then uh, fiscal 2024, which is in three years from now, uh, about two and a half years, 887 million in revenue. So you don't see huge growth the next couple of years. So on top line, bottom line, uh, earnings per share last fiscal year, $5.20, three years from now, $6.14. Again, not huge growth, less than 20% growth uh, in earnings per share over a three-year period. Uh, so it's not something, again, uh, that jumps out at me. We could take a look at it here again. Uh, it doesn't jump out at me, but it is one that uh, maybe you look at. It's in the right trends and right sector. I just don't like the valuations right here. The next one we'll take a look at is uh, Dolby Laboratories, uh, symbol DLB. You may be familiar with this. It's, a, it's, a, it's an audio company, and you've probably seen you know, Dolby Sound. It's all over the place. You go to movie theaters, you name it. About three quarters of its revenue comes from licenses out its audio technology to um, electronics manufacturers. So that's a great business right there. Uh, it's about a uh, $9.2 billion company. Revenue last fiscal year just ended, $1.28 billion. Fiscal year 2024, again, about three years from now, $1.6 billion. So you're not seeing big growth. Uh, earnings per share, 366 a share last fiscal year, three years later, 485. So a little better there, but again, it's just, it's not, a, it doesn't jump out at me as a huge growth uh, company. Valuation is a little bit better than Aspen. Uh, it does have a bit of a very niche business. So I think you can continue to see it grow. It could be a nice slow mover over the next five to 10 years. Uh, I just don't see it being a huge one, but again, it has pricing power. So it could outperform this year if inflation stays high. Uh, the next one is uh, what they call a Electronic Design Automation Firm, an EDA. And the name of the company is uh, uh, Cadence uh, Design, symbol CDNS. And you can see here, the chart on this is pretty fantastic compared to some of the others. And I'll even zoom out here a little bit before you look at our weekly chart. You can see, I mean, this, this baby's been going straight up. And look at this uptrend line. I mean, right here almost looks like a great buying opportunity in the pullback that we've had in uh, Cadence Design Systems from above, above 190 to the low 160. So it pulled back over 20% in a matter of two and a half weeks. And uh, very oversold. The RSI, which uh, is a relative strength index, which is an overbought, oversold oscillator. It's down here. And that up there is 100, down here is zero. It's at 1.77. So it's about as oversold as it can come. Still above uh, long-term support trend line, above the 200 moving average, above support here around 150. It doesn't look too bad, folks. I gotta tell you, I don't have any exposure to any of these stocks. Nothing's a buy or sell recommendation. Uh, but again, uh, just put out there, it's a bigger company. It's nearly $45 billion. And um, they primarily worked with semiconductor companies for, for most of their years. But now as technology continues to open up into a lot of my trends, including uh, Internet of Things, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, they're spreading their wings. So I really do like this company. Um, 2020, last year, they had revenue of $2.5 billion, looking for $3.5 billion in 2024. So again, not big growth on the, on the on top line. Bottom line, two eighty dollars a share they made last year. 2024 and three years from now, looking for about three ninety six. dollars Let's call it $4 a share. So much better growth there on the top line, or sorry, on the bottom line. And so, you know, you can make a case for this to be much higher in the next five to 10 years as it moves. Uh, but again, just want to throw on, on our list there. And number one was software. Number three was software. And number four, believe it or not, 
is software as well. And you, I'm sure you've heard of this. Uh, this is a, a big company. We've all used it or use it on a daily basis. It's Adobe Systems. So ADBE, it's a, you know, they kind of changed up their business model years ago and went to a subscription model and it was fantastic for the company, one of the big software winners. I mean, so big that it's now a $238 billion company, folks. So Adobe, we all know what it does. You know, it's, it's a subscription model uh, for design, all types of stuff, um, you know, whether it be Photoshop or uh, all the designers that they have. They had revenue uh, last fiscal year just ended, 15.78 billion. In the next three years, looking to go to 23 billion. So that's some pretty darn nice growth for a company that size. Um, earnings per share of 12.58 last fiscal year, uh, looking for 18.70 in fiscal year 2024, which is about two and a half years from now. So again, pretty darn good, all things considered. So it, it's not, not none of these software stocks jump out because their valuations are cheap. Um, but what you look as you look at Adobe being at an all time high near $700 in November and then pulling back on Monday hitting 500. So it pulled back 200 bucks in about six weeks. And you know, at 700 when it's breaking to a new all time high, it's about to hit $700. If I said to you, listen, I'll sell it to you at 500 bucks, you'd say, heck yeah. So now I pull back. I'm not saying it stops here at 500, it could go lower, but I'm just saying you have to kind of take a step back and think of things sometimes relatively, not just where they are today. And the last one we're going to take a look at. Um, is a co-star group, uh, symbol CSGP. This had a nice breakout in October, ran to a new all-time high. Uh, it was above $100, uh, as you can see here, for the first time ever. Broke big consolidation over a year, and then uh, it's gotten hit over the last uh, couple of months here. Now down, hit 70, below $70 on Monday. So over 30% on the downside uh, in a matter of about, in a little less than three, about three months. So what they do is they provide um, commercial real estate data uh, and listing platforms, and they own uh, basically five brands. You've probably heard of it. If you ever look for commercial real estate, LoopNet. It also owns Apartments.com, uh, CoStar Suite, uh, Biz Buy Sell, as well as Lands of America. About three quarters of their revenue comes from subscription model, which I, which I like. That's really nice. Um, revenue uh, last year, 1.65 million. 2023, looking for 2.6. So it's got some nice growth. I like that. You look at earnings per share, 99 cents last year, buck 76 in uh, three years from there. So three years up, you know, if it hits it about 77%, I like that as well. So th there's definitely some upside potential here. Uh, the one risk is if real estate, especially commercial real estate, suddenly slows down, uh, we have some type of bubble, interest rates go much higher. Uh, when we see people stop buying commercial real estate, uh, I'm looking for commercial real estate right now in the South Florida area. It's very difficult. I mean, anything good's gone. We, we looked all weekend and couldn't find much. Also looking for a house down here. No inventory down here at all. Um, so just, yeah, I, there is still big upside in it, but um, there's a huge risk of the real estate market, which I don't know if I'm willing to take that risk. All right, I wanna talk about Bitcoin real quick. I got a chart here for sure to show you. And I think it's, it's important to take a look at this. And um, right now you can see here, this is a chart of Bitcoin we're looking at. And this is again, a candlestick. And I drew this blue line because we had a pullback in September, pulled back right below 40,000. It rallied up to new all time high, right around 70,000. Then we pulled back again. And on Monday we broke below uh, the 40,000 level again. And we bounced off it. I mean, look at how it was the exact same price nearly as that intraday low back in September. Now, if I zoom out a little bit more, folks, what I really like about this, and again, charts aren't perfect, but as you can see, we had a lot of resistance, 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 finally broke through, retest it, retest it, and rally. Resistance turns into support. So that it just proves how important that 40,000 uh, level is on Bitcoin. So if we can keep an eye on that 40,000 level, and if we can hold above there, right here at 40,000 level, I think uh, we are setting up for a pretty darn nice big rally from here. And I think, you know, up to even the low 50s. And from there, it's about a 25% move. So something to keep an eye on. I definitely wouldn't be selling here. Uh, I wouldn't be selling either way. I, you know, I'm a buy and hold. I'm looking for uh, six digits, looking for hundred grand. I'm not selling until then. And I have a bunch of altcoins too. You all know that. Uh, but but what I, what I want to press here is if for some reason you need to get out, you want to sell, Definitely don't sell when you're sitting above support because your downside risk from here is not that low or not that much with your upside potential to the next resistance level around 52,000 is, is big. So you say 2,000 on downside, that's called 11,000 the upside, 11 and two. So that's a, a five and a half to one. That's a pretty good uh, setup for you. So keep that in mind. I just wanna cover that a little bit here for you. And then last, I'm gonna wrap up with a couple stocks here, four stocks that are in healthcare testing. Um, the testing, genetic testing uh, more uh, specifically, these stocks have been crushed. 
So the first one we're going to take a look at, and this is a stock that a lot of people know because I recommended it a few years ago before COVID. So it was one of my huge winners in the last couple of years for my subscribers in my old publication, and that's a Fulgent Technologies, symbol FLGT. And uh, it was a very tiny company recommended it. Now, you know, after the pullback, you can see it topped out there in February and it's pulled back. Uh, but Fulgen is about a $2.5 billion company right now. They do genetic testing as well as COVID testing. And that's why they get, they've had a huge run up. In 2019, get these numbers. They had sales of 32.5 million. In 2020, because of COVID, 421.7 million. So that's about, I mean, almost 15X in one year. 2021, which is, which is wrapped up and will be coming out with earnings soon, estimates for 930 million from two years prior at 32 to 930. And in next year, 2022, or this current year, I should say, they're looking for it to dip down a little bit because they think COVID testing is going to slow down, slow down to about 592 million, which again, it's still for a company like this is unbelievable. They lost two cents a share in 2019 before COVID. Uh, 2020, uh, $9.44 a share, insane. And then, you know, even a little more this year, uh, in the teens this year, and then even next, or, or sorry, 2021, 2022, this year, looking at about $6.04. So even at that, at a 20 times, uh, you know, next year's uh, estimate, puts it at 120 and changes at 84 now. So there's obviously some big upside here in the near term. And even though I think COVID will, will not weigh on the economy and growth as much, it doesn't mean I don't think that you're going to see testing all over the place. I mean, the demand for tests is insane. When I was in Pennsylvania, half my family got it. I didn't get it. But I went to the CVS call that I went to pick up something else. And the guy said, and the phone rang. He's like, you know, we actually have a joke running here, like a little pool. How many people call? And I kept checking. He goes, there's so many people calling for COVID tests over holidays that they had to stop. I mean, it's, it's, literally, it's like it comes in and the moment it gets off the truck, it's gone. So that does that's not ending anytime soon. So that, that is a company to keep an eye on. And again, I, I liked him before that. So I think there's also some other good um, qualities to the company. Uh, another one that is uh, in the COVID uh, area here as well is uh, QDEL. And uh, QDEL, I, I never know how to pronounce this, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to call it QDEL just because it, I don't know, for no reason. But you can see here in this chart, uh, it had a big rally actually in December and it's fell since then. It, th this company came out, um, it's a $5.3 billion company, it does rapid diagnostic tests. Uh, they came out and they said that their fist, they, they, came out and uh, pre-announced for fiscal fourth quarter uh, 2021, uh, so the fourth quarter. Total revenues in the range of $633 million to $673 million. And for the whole year, uh, they're saying about $1.69 uh, to $1.7 million in sales, which isn't bad considering it's a $5.3 billion, billion dollar company. These are billions if I didn't say that. And the consensus estimate was much lower for both the fourth quarter and the full year. Uh, the COVID revenues in the fourth quarter of the 435 middle range, or sorry, 635 million middle range, about 510 from COVID. So majority of it's coming from COVID. So you see why the stocks aren't trading at highs because if COVID stops, slows down and disappears and testing ends, these companies could see a huge amount of revenue come out. They said in the fourth quarter that their uh, quick view COVID-19 antigen tests, so about 65 million. Uh, their Sophia SARS antigen tests, so about 4 million. Uh, best quarterly sales volume they've seen for any test uh, for them. And if I look forward, 2019, they had 534 million sales before COVID. 2020, 1.66 billion. Uh, this past year, again, looking for about 1.7 billion. So not much difference between 2021 and 2022. Or sorry, 2021 and 2020. For 2023, looking at skipping this year going to next year, about 734 million. So it'd be cut in about half. So it's tough. And you look at earnings per share uh, last year, $19.92 a share. Uh, you're looking 2023 for looking out down about $3.90 a share. So probably one I stay away from because there's a concern to me that if the COVID goes away, the COVID testing demand goes away, this company is really going to lose quite a bit. Uh, the other two are not in the COVID industry. So it's more kind of just looking at the company. One, uh, first one we're going to take a look at uh, is Invite. It's about a $2.7 billion company. Uh, they uh, work on genetic testing for cancer. They look for hereditary things, neurological diseases, uh, you name it. But you look at this chart, and this is a stock that I've liked for a while, absolutely demolished. It was at 60 bucks in December. Uh, so 13 months later, it's at 12 and change. And what I find fascinating about this company, again, it's $2.7 billion. Revenue in 2020 was 279 million, looking for 463 in 2021. And by 2023, 915 million. 
So it's only trading about three times that sales. Um, it's, it's still losing money. And it's expected to lose about two bucks a share the next couple of years uh, per year. So I think that's what's weighing on it. But again, it's got a great product. Uh, it's in a great mega trend. Not all the testing companies are going to make it. You'll see some consolidation. And also, I think, you know, even a company like this, it could be a trade at several billion dollars and still from here double. Uh, so big, big upside. The last one is Natera, N-T-R-A. And uh, this is one that's about a $6.6 .6 billion company, genetic testing company. Uh, they work on fetuses. So pregnancy, uh, they'll test the fetus for different diseases. You can see here again, was doing pretty well throughout the year, trading near an all-time high at 125. Since that time, uh, it's down about what, $55, $50, $55. Pretty amazing how it's pulled back. Um, again, you look at the, the sales, 2020 of 391 million sales, 2021 looking for 621. So even during, you know, a lot of times things were shut down, still going up. By 2023, 951 million. Nice, nice growth for a company like this. However, again, I think the concern is that it is losing about $4 a share per year next couple of years. So they're not, they're not making money yet. And they're missing that one thing that in the near term is that path of profitability. But I want to throw them out there and just kind of show you what kind of stocks are out there um, in different areas. I mean, we, we went from companies with pricing power that ha happened to be heavily into software. Um, we talked about Bitcoin, we talked about the market overall, and then looking at uh, some genetic testing uh, and COVID testing stocks. So a lot of opportunity out there, folks. I did not buy yet this week, but there's a good chance I will be doing some buying. I've been bought in a few weeks of my own money. Uh, I got quite a bit of cash sitting around, so I think I'm going to start doing that. Um, so maybe I'll let you know. I'm obviously not telling you what I buy, uh, but I'll let you know when I start hitting that buy button on the shows. But I, I'm feeling like there's a lot of capitulation. There's a lot of fear in individual investors. And that's typically when I would start taking my toe and put my toe back in the water. And I'm feeling that this week. So I wouldn't be very surprised if I start doing some buying this week. All right, if you have any questions or comments, please put them below here on the page. And uh, again, I want to thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you for the support. Uh, I know we have a weird background here. Um, I'm in the midst of moving from Baltimore to Florida, close, sold a condo, closed next month. Uh, as we look for office space around here, we may have something later this week. We're going to set up a beautiful podcast studio down here in Florida. And once we do, don't get it wrong, it's going to look awesome. But in the meantime, we have some weird backgrounds. But we're here for you because this is a crazy market right now. I want to make sure that I don't leave you hanging at any point and uh, let you know that I am here. We're not disappearing. I'm still working every day. All right, folks, thank you so much. Once again, I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.